box spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast on the Met Always. As we go through the rest of this Easter weekend, for most of us we've seen, continued to see the mix of some sunshine but also the risk of some rain at times. It's all courtesy of this area low pressure which is going to hang around as we go through the next few days. But with winds coming up from the south, it should feel a little bit less cold. So as we end Good Friday, still the risk of some showers across parts of Scotland, Northern Ireland, maybe western fringes of England and Wales, but elsewhere turning and clear with the risk of a few misty patches forming come dawn and also a touch of frost in the countryside. So we do start Saturday off on a bit of a chilly note but some sunshine from the word go. Risk of a little bit of cloud and patchy rain just reaching the very far east of England and the main focus of any showers tomorrow will be again across more western and northern parts of the country but there should be a little bit fewer and further between compared to today. Temperature-wise, in the sunshine, not feeling too bad. Highs reaching around 14 or 15 degrees. Having a look at Easter Day, a bit of a cloudy start across many eastern parts, but that will burn its way back towards the North Sea. So for many, again, it's another day of some sunny spells, risk of a few showers, potentially a little bit more in the way of persistent rain just arriving in the very far southwestern corner. And that sets us up for a bit of a north-south split on Monday. Rather grey and wet in the south, but hanging on to the sunshine further north. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
It's 8 o'clock from the world headquarters of GB News. This is Friday Night Live with me, Ben Leo, standing in for the imitable Mr Mark Dolan. And it's Easter bank holiday weekend, don't you know? It feels like Christianity has been losing its identity in recent years, but I'll share a special Easter message very shortly that will hopefully lift your spirits. Elsewhere tonight, Britain is in the thick of a devastating knife crime epidemic. How on earth did we get into this situation? How do we escape from it? And remember this legend... Yes, that's right, the hotly anticipated MJ the Musical, celebrating the legacy of Michael Jackson, my hero, by the way. It premiered in London's West End last night, but some party poopers reckon the king of pop should be cancelled over his child abuse allegations. Is this celebration of Jacko's legacy deserved or insulting to his victims? And as 300 kids go feral in Milton Keynes, storming a shopping centre and causing havoc, should parents be punished for the poor behaviour of their children? This is Friday Night Live with me, Ben Leo. Bring your own drinks or Easter eggs and let's get cracking. On tonight's show, my Friday friends, TV personality Ingrid Tarrant and political commentator Kai Wilshaw, plus renowned businessman and anti-knife campaigner Henry Smith, and of course, Friday Night Live favourite Alexandra Marshall, live from Australia. How I'd love to be there now. My Friday Big Opinion is on the way, but first, here's your news headlines with Sam Francis. Ben, thanks very much and good evening from the GB Newsroom. Just gone eight o'clock and we start with uh, the latest developments coming out of Northern Ireland tonight where the new leader of the Democratic Unionist Party has condemned what he calls conspiracy theories and cheap political point scoring. That's following the criminal charges made against Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. The shock resignation of the former DUP leader and longest serving MP in Northern Ireland came after he was accused of serious historical sex offences. Gavin Robinson was unanimously appointed as the interim leader earlier for the party. He says the charges against Donaldson were a devastating revelation. Things caused tremendous shock, not just for myself personally or my colleagues within the DUP, but for the community right across Northern Ireland. It came as a great shock. Um, but we are a party and individuals that believe in justice. We have faith in our criminal justice system. Uh, and so... In the coming days and months, I think it is important that none of us say anything or act in any way uh, that would seek to prejudice <clears throat> what is now an ongoing criminal investigation. In other news, one of the Conservative Party's major donors has received a knighthood as part of a controversial honours list from Rishi Sunak. Mohammed Mansour gave £5 million to the Tories last year and is a senior treasurer for the party. He was knighted for what's been described as services to business, to charity and politics. Other recipients include MP Philip Davies, who is also a former presenter on this network. The timing of the list, though, is unusual, coming while Parliament is in recess and on the eve of the Easter bank holiday weekend. Police are tonight appealing for help in their search for a man suspected of raping two women in London. The attacks took place four years apart, first in Westminster in 2018, followed by another incident in Shoreditch in 2022. Those offences were being investigated as separate crimes, but forensic work has helped to draw a link between the two. Detectives say it's highly likely the suspect has also committed other attacks. The Metropolitan Force has released this EFIT image you can see here if you're watching on television, and they're asking anyone who may have information to contact police. And police in London are also issuing an urgent appeal to help locate a disabled boy's specially modified van. The Cariazzo family's 13-year-old son, Elijah, has a rare, life-limiting muscular condition, and his custom vehicle was used to transport his vital medical equipment. Well, CCTV footage you can see here again if you're watching on TV shows the moment that the Ford Transit was stolen from East London. Elijah's mother, Anessa, told GB News that she hopes the van is returned before her son's birthday, which she said could be their last holiday together. It's not the van that you took, but it's our freedom as a family. 
his freedom as to whatever life he's got. He's got a limited time here and we just hope that you pull something in your heart to look at this as not a material thing but look at this as what you could give to elijah into whatever life whatever we could squeeze in to whatever limited time we've got and finally before we hand back to ben in canada a state of emergency has been declared as niagara falls is bracing for record crowds during a total solar eclipse the dramatic natural wonder situated along the Canadian-US border is in the path of that eclipse due on the 8th of April. The region's authorities have said the decision has been made out of an abundance of caution to manage the biggest crowd of visitors ever expected to flock to the popular waterfalls. With up to a million stargazers and sightseers predicted, many people are already splurging on hotels, securing their spot to experience the rare sight. Those are the latest headlines. More in the next hour. You can also sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code there on your screen. Or if you're listening on radio, go to our website, gbnews.com alerts. Thank you, Sam. And good evening to you lovely folk watching from home. And most importantly, a good Friday to you ahead of the Easter bank holiday weekend. Yeah, that's right. It's Easter. Did you remember? I know we've been conditioned in recent times to, I don't know, I guess renounce our faith at the altar of political correctness. Gesture eggs, defacing hot cross buns, even the industrial baptising of channel migrants who couldn't give a toss about Christianity, but who simply want to scam the system and stay in the UK. But let me remind you of something. This is a Christian country. The Anglican Church maintains its status of religion of the state and the King, Charles, he's still head of the church. So, never forget it. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not a practicing Christian. I certainly wouldn't indoctrinate my kids with the idea of religion either, but I do have some faith in some sort of a God, and I believe in the lessons of Jesus Christ. Do to others as you'd want done to yourself. Love your neighbor, value peace, value truth. Don't lie, don't steal. Cherish relationships with people, with nature, and even yourself. And of course, be grateful, show gratitude. So you don't need to be a religious nut to think those things are pretty good values to live your life by. And I guess maybe if more of us did take heed of those lessons, we wouldn't end up with the feral gangs of kids we saw running riot in places like Milton Keynes yesterday. Or just maybe, if more of us were brought up to value life as Jesus did and to never take the life of another, we wouldn't see the kind of knife crime savagery, savagery currently gripping London. So look, like I said, I'm going to stress this, I'm not asking you to go and repent your sins while reciting verses of the Bible, despite what some militant Christians will try and force you to do. In actual fact, one of them last week on Twitter told me that Jesus wouldn't love me because he doesn't allow us to be half in, half out. Well, let me tell you something, pal. That kind of Jesus doesn't sound very loving to me. And my version of the bloke is a lot more generous than the judgmental and conditional person you like to portray. So this Easter, let's come together for family, friendship, faith in something bigger than ourselves and faith that things will work out for the better. Because if we don't have faith in the future, there's little to live for today. And if you don't care about any of that, just enjoy the chocolate. <laughs> I'm going to get stuck into mine now. And by the way, my panel tonight, uh, my big panel, <laughs> the wokest man in Britain used to belong to Benjamin Butterworth, but it now belongs to Kai Wilshaw, who was on Saturday Five with me a few weeks ago. And you were too far left for even Benjamin Butterworth. And of course, the very talented TV personality, Ingrid Tarrant. Hello, Good ben. evening to you both. Thank you for being here. I'm going to be uh, Willy Wonka for the next couple of minutes. Kai, this is for you. Caramel oh, Crunch, wow. Happy Easter. Oh. And How did you know? <laughs> Ingrid, uh, for you, utterly nuttily. Utterly nuttily? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Is that... Picked, of course, to uh, suggest that you're absolutely barking mad. Uh, thank you. Well, funnily enough, I've got something for you. Oh. It's not as big. This will be my first one of the weekend. 
Look. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Easter bunny lollipop, there we go. Yeah. I feel terrible for being empty-handed now. That's all right, look, that's what happens with the Wokies and you left things. You only think of yourselves, <laughs> don't you? So, come on then, let's get your thoughts on that, uh, that big opinion. Um, as I said, I'm not, I'm not a massive religious person, but I do kind of have some sort of affinity with Jesus and God, you know, whatever that is. Is it important we kind of heed the lessons of Jesus in some aspects of our lives, do you reckon, Ingrid? Yes, definitely. And you don't have to be religious to um, look at the Ten Commandments and put them into just normal, everyday living. So it is, as you rightly said, do unto others as you'd like to have done to yourself. Don't steal, don't um, kill. You know, the Ten Commandments are actually, you know, a very, very good guideline. It makes you mm. follow the rules to be a good person that other people respect and it's all about mutual respect. Are you religious? I'm not Bible bashing as such. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no offence um, to anyone watching to, who... Uh... No, and I don't go to church every Sunday, but I do say my prayers every night and I do believe in God. Yeah. Um, and, and I find comfort in that. This is all getting a bit deep, isn't it, for a Friday night? Well, Ty, it is what, Easter. What, what do you reckon? <laughs> well, I'm going to surprise you. I actually grew up in quite a strong tradition of Welsh non-conformist church going. Um, we're not particularly pious, to be honest. Um, we're not that religious, but I think it's really about those values of community and honesty. And as you say, just because there is a decline in church going in the United Kingdom, it doesn't mean that we have to cast off all those values behind that faith and behind uh, Christian religion. And so I totally agree. I think, you know, we need to bear that in mind. And I do feel, not only with Easter, but also with other religious holidays, that they have seem to become too commercial, right? Mm. Mm. Every uh, January, as soon as the Christmas stuff is out of the shops, the Easter eggs well, can, I, can I just make a point? In recent weeks, we've had um, that situation, which wasn't Cadbury's, by the way. Let me make that clear. It was the shop selling the Easter eggs, but they labelled mm. it as gesture eggs. We had an incident with Westminster Council earlier today where they had a um, Ramadan display and nothing about Easter, which they hurriedly went to amend. Mm. We've had uh, various examples of... It feels like Christianity being kind of eroded away from society. Do you, is that intentional? I mean, what's going on there? It almost seems to be intentional but because it's happening so quickly and it's so obvious. And it's right to say, we are a Christian country and we're not upholding it. We're almost embarrassed. That's the terrible problem. So we do all the virtue signalling for the, the, the Muslims and, um, and immigrants. We make people feel very welcome from other cultures, which is exactly right. But it doesn't mean that we actually have to ignore our own culture mm. to accommodate other people of different cultures. Why are we, why are we so godless? Do you know... Because I, uh, because I reckon, right, if I walk down the high street tomorrow and I asked 100 people, do you believe in God or do you believe in Jesus? Not necessarily, mm. like me, are you an absolute, you know, religious fanatic, but mm. do you just believe in mm. Jesus or God? I reckon most people would say no. Do you know, I think statistically it's under 50%. I think it's something like 47%. Yeah. Um, um, don't, well, believe... But they, and then you break that down and they don't know what they believe in, kind of like something, but they're not practising Christians and that yeah. is really terrible. But, do you know, uh, the church itself doesn't help. Um, a lot of the... Um, I, I did occasionally go to church and it, it became quite um, politicised, mm. uh, even with village issues. <laughs> Honestly. And well, like, I don't, like nosy neighbours, cur curtain switches. It is that, and yeah. I don't go to church that. I like to hear a really good sermon that's appropriate to us and the, and the way that we live and to uphold values and morals and, and, and things like that. Not for it to become sort of like a, a pulpit to, to point out political things or even, like, little village things. Yeah, I yeah. think it's wrong. Get it. But, Kai, so you, you grew up going to church, right? Yes. Do you think that some of today's... Behaviour we see, especially from young people. We saw mm. the, the clips from Milton Keynes. We've seen some yeah. really horrific incidents this week on, um, you know, the train with the stabbing. There was another stabbing in London as well. Do you think any of that boils down to the fact that people don't believe in something bigger than themselves and, you know, what have they got yeah. to live for, pretty much? Uh, I think it's also about the fact that there are no community hubs anymore. You know, for me, 
Oh, when oh, I Amy, went to Amy church. Amy Turner said that earlier. What, like, live reason you've I, I know, I know, but, but it's I think... It's such a cop-out. No, but it's not, because... It's you know, true, if you, I agree. If you look at funding for ch uh, children's <laughs> services, for instance, right, 2010, £1.4 billion pounds a year. Now, it's less than £500 million. Pounds. And churches often were also that hub of activity that meant the people stayed out of trouble, that they learned about the sort of morals that you were talking about in your introduction. That doesn't exist anymore, and I no think we've Sunday lost school, that. that. Whether sounds really exactly, old yeah, but, but okay. whether it's religious or not, you know, I mean, mm. I used to go to a uh, youth evening class as part of the, the, the as part of my church. And not everybody was religious. In fact, we had lots of scientists in there who completely disavowed religion. But we talked openly about faith, science, philosophy, and it meant that we had something to yeah, bind I, us all I together. Have, I, didn't, I didn't grow up playing table tennis and ping pong in a youth club, and I haven't gone out and stabbed people and, you know, behaved like an absolute president. There's, okay. there's, there's no excuse for that, of course. You know, and, and also, I'll just make this point as well. A lot of people have really hard upbringings and go through a lot of, you know, so-called trauma and stuff. But the, the wise thing to do, and most people do this, is they learn from what, you know, they don't become a victim and then use that as an excuse to behave badly. They use it as inspiration to, to say, you know, I went through this, I didn't enjoy the experience, I'm going to use it, for example, I'll be a good father, I'm going to be a really good father to my kids because my father as a, as a child was horrible. I don't think the fact that there aren't youth clubs or Sunday services, I think it's absolute... It's, yes. it's not a silver bullet. Yeah, it's not but... a silver bullet, but that is part of it. Yes. But, you know, it's easier said than done because a lot of these kids don't have um, the stability of the family that perhaps all of us did have. And that's well, I why... Didn't. I didn't have a stable family growing up. But were they a good family? Did they sort of... In... You would... You would uh, I'm, did I'm did absolute... they have values? I'm absolutely not ever going to go into detail about my childhood growing up because it would blow your mind, <laughs> but I... Uh, was it stable? No, absolutely. All right, absolutely then stable not. Perhaps... But I'm not. I'm not a wrongin. Well, some people. No, might you're think not wrongin. wrongin but... No, you're not wrongin. <laughs> but then you were lucky and uh, and fortunate, I should say. Or maybe you're in an environment where the influence of the other kids and their families had that positive influence on you, so that you, what your family, uh, the, uh, you know, sort of how you were brought up was kind of just in the shade of the yeah. way that the others are brought up, because I do think that's a, a huge part of it. It's, it's your immediate environment. So when you talk about kids looking for inspiration and sort of saying, I'm not going to do this, I'm, I'm going to learn by the mistakes of my parents or whatever, if you're in a, an environment like a sink estate, you can't see out of it. Yeah. Mm. You're I in a black hole, and that's why it's so hard, and that's why we do need to kind of draw together, give them something to make them or help them aspire to things that they can see the goodness in them and not learn. It's learned behaviour, a lot of this. Mm. I, I get, actually, I had a, a very loving and decent mother growing up, so I maybe attribute a lot of things to her. But, Kai, do you reckon, um, in terms of all these youngsters running around and, you know, pulling knives on each other... Yeah. Do we need to maybe start Sunday schools or something like that, as you've alluded to? Or, I reckon, which is an even better idea, national service, two years of it. I don't think it's a bad idea. Well, I mean, really? but, but, as we were saying, there's all sorts of different things that will allow kids to pull themselves up, get out of a situation that, you know, isn't good for them, right? Whether it's youth centres, church, sports, music, I mean, all of those things are part of it, right? But. I do think we need to really refocus on what are those avenues to get kids out of trouble, to keep them socialising. I mean, you know, after the COVID pandemic, when they were completely unsocialised, and now, you know, you hear from teachers that kids are feral, right? <laughs> Screens don't help, I love, I love phones that don't help. I mean, all of this needs to be solved in some way. And I think that, yes, churches, uh, sort of a... Children's services are part of the answer, but you know anything to get yeah, yeah. kids out of that mm. those circumstances is to be uh, recommended. I also, think. but nothing really works in Britain these days. I do feel sorry for young people; <laughs> they can't get houses. They're not having families because of that. Mm. Um, you know, the mm. future does look a bit bleak. But my point is, without being too religious or preachy, Jesus on this Easter weekend had some good lessons. So. Uh, Maybe let's try and take heed of them. Right, coming up, Britain is in the thick of a devastating knife crime epidemic, as we've just been discussing. So how on earth did we get into the situation and how do we escape it? I'm going to be joined by anti-knife crime campaigner uh, to get to the bottom of it, whose brother-in-law was actually murdered
by a knife man. And also, I'm asking, change of gear, was Michael Jackson innocent of the accusations thrown at him? I'll explain more in just a tick. Stay with me. Dubes & Co. Weekdays from 6pm. Um, the Guardian's not happy, any, everybody, because uh, one of their headline stories today was about a private members club uh, that is for gentlemen only, the Garrick Club, I refer to, in London. Uh, there's accusations now, Quinton, that it's all the kind of upper echelons of society, all the, the powerful... It's a cabal elite. of important, powerful people who are running the country. And I thought to myself, <laughs> when I heard descriptions like that, I bet Quentin Letts is somehow involved. <laughs> Are you? I've been, I've been to the Garrick Why a few times. Why can't women be members? Because it's a gents club. My, my daughter, my, one of my daughters, is a member of an all-women's club called the University Women's Club. And uh, uh, they don't allow blokes in. It's an outrage! No, it's not. It's, it's, it's a free country. I mean, it's archaic and it needs to change. What is? You know, is my view. The fact that the Garrick doesn't submit women members. There are lots of these members clubs, um, you know, across London, probably in other parts of the country as well, and, you know, you have to pay for membership, so it is well-to-do members of society that go. I've no, no nothing against them existing, but all of them have changed their constitution. Those that were once men only, you know, they all now admit women. The only exception now is the Garrick. My other thought is, well, why are we genuinely why are we talking about it if we've got nothing more important going on? Just to be frank, I genuinely could not care less uh, if there is a club that I'm not allowed into because of my sex. Um, I do though think that if you're going to start, you're allowed in though. They let them in. Yeah, but not as members. Yeah. Um, but I do think if you're going to start, um, you know, having all of this kind of respect and all the rest of it for single sex spaces for men, then you can't, as a society, allow uh, the ridiculousness that goes on in female spaces when a man uh, sticks a dress on and a wig maybe and a bit of lipstick if he's feeling bold uh, and says that he's called Sharon and then wants to be allowed into that space and then those uh, establishments then buckle and let those men actually into things like changing rooms of women. That really, really annoys me. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. On Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., a TV exclusive with former Immigration Minister Robert Jemrick, and he is scathing about Rishi Sunak. Would you try to talk about legal immigration and, and it was just battered away? Yes. And sexual assaults are taking place in migrant hotels. I did see uh, some very concerning incidents, for example, at the asylum hotels, uh, individuals committing sexual assault. Also, find out why queers for Palestine want us to boycott Eurovision and is Ramadan more popular than Easter? Don't miss Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m. Be there. Is Ramadan more popular than Easter? That's the question, isn't it, for Patrick to delve deep into tonight? I've just been getting stuck into uh, this Easter egg. I know someone's emailed me saying that you shouldn't eat Easter eggs until Sunday night, but here I am. I told you I wasn't a very strict Christian. Anyway, we move on. Um, Britain, of course, as we know, it's in the grip of a knife crime epidemic. People are getting stabbed on public transport, kids being caught with massive zom uh, zombie knives. And really, that kind of stuff doesn't ri uh, raise eyebrows anymore. So shocking stats from the ONS, the Office uh, for National Statistics, say that knife crime rose by a full 5% last year, with the Ben Kinsella Trust reporting police recorded offences involving a knife or sharp instrument went up by a staggering, get this, 78% in the 10 years leading up to June 2023. So what's gone wrong in our society to lead to such a tragic situation? How many more people need to die before proper action is taken? And crucially, who on earth is to blame? 
With me now is anti-knife crime campaigner and the founder of Wicker's charity, Henry Smith. Good evening, Henry. Thank you for joining us. Um, right. let's, let's try and cover the, the simple questions first. Who's to blame for this absolute meteoric rise in knife crime? Well, I think you've got to start... Not, it's got to start from the communities. Not blaming the communities, but I think we've got to start... The communities have got to understand that there's a problem. And I think we've got to go back to, like, we were... In, literally in my day, where we had social clubs, where you mix people, so they're not strangers, where this postcode war, where literally young people cannot cross the road. You know, that's what we've got to do. Uh, you can take all the knives off the street, and you're never going to take the knives off the street. Henry, can I ask, if you don't mind, your brother-in-law was murdered by a knifeman. What happened? How long ago was it? Oh, that was a lot. That was the best part of 40 years ago, you know. Um... Yeah, that was a, a tragic incident. You know, that was a 23-year-old man who had one child. His wife, my sister, had another child on the way. So this wow. resonates with me. And as, as you say, we have, we've just seen this escalate. Every year it seems to get worse and worse. I'm, I'm not sure if you caught my big opinion a few minutes ago, but I was basically saying maybe society needs to adopt more, certainly not a religious doctrine, but certainly some of the values maybe of Jesus. And I mentioned Jesus because it's, you know, it's Easter weekend. Do you think that we've kind of become a bit of a godless society? I think we've become a godless society without a doubt, haven't we? It's sad. It really is, isn't it? There seems to be no values and no values instilled in a lot of young people. Uh, it, it is their, their, their attitude. And I think it's upon us to sort of change that if we can. And... Honestly, to solve this problem, for me, I'm probably sounding very ignorant here, but why don't we just have a zero-tolerance approach to carrying knives? 20 years, if you get caught in possession, no questions asked, you're in the, the banger. Well, well, let's just start with the country only has 500 cells available anyway. OK, I mean, but what you're saying is you're going to send young people that might have made a mistake to prison, that they might end up lifetime criminals. It starts off with four-month sentence, but that's at the discretion of a court for an under-16-year-old. I think it's less than 12% that actually go to court. After 16, it's six months. Very few people on a first offence ever get sent to prison. But if you, if you wind the clock back, what we want to do is to stop them going to prison. By doing what we do, for instance, we, we go into schools, we actually talk to them, we, we show them you know, literally real pictures of people that have been stabbed where, you know, upon where they've been healthy, and we explain to them there is no gain in actually carrying a knife. And it's what we do as well quite well, we take police with us, but these police are not dressed as policemen. So people, young children are very relaxed when they see somebody like yourself in a suit, in a, in a jacket, and it's only after that literally they've had an hour that we say, and this is a policeman because we need these youngsters to not be afraid of police. We need them to be able to walk up to them, chat to them, and understand that they are there for them. But of course, the Bobby is, is, is not on the street anymore, is he? Okay, well, let's bring in our um, panel Kai Wilshaw and Ingrid Tarrant. Um, Kai, have you ever, I, I say this in, in all seriousness because you live in London, have you ever been mugged at knife point or, or robbed? I haven't. But I constantly see uh, accounts on social media where yet more people are being robbed. I think, I mean, yes, London has a specific issue here. We've been talking about that a great deal. But what strikes me about some of these ONS statistics is just how many urban areas as well are seeing a huge increase in knife crime. So let's not pretend that it's just an urban issue or a London issue. I think this is much wider than that. We need to not be too simplistic about what that means and because that will impact also what kind of solutions we can bring to the table. Henry, is, is that the case? Is it, is it sparring out to urban areas? It really is, isn't it? I mean, you've, I mean, I'm not saying that they've stabbed anyone today, but 300 children today running feral, you know, in that shopping centre, it's going to escalate, isn't it? Yeah, well, what did you make of that? You saw those images, 300-odd kids, it's, scores of them running but, riot... Because they know there is no punishment for it, don't they? They know that they can get away with it. They watch. We find, we are, one of our things is we believe that social media really brings this to them. And it shows them that they can go into these supermarkets, they can go and steal, and they just get away with it. I mean, there's no accountability. We have lost all law in this country. And it's, it's a re really sad thing.
Is it any particular community or demographic of people who are committing knife crime or certainly more than others? I mean, of course, it's, I mean, it's concentrated in London, yes. And you do have, for instance, a lot of sort of ethnics as such that they're more inclined to do it. But it's not just stuff. It's not just those. I mean, it is a cross, but it is, it's more intense in ethnic communities. Why is that? Well, why is it? Well, <laughs> there's, a, there's really a loaded Friday night really, question for you. Uh, I really can't. I, I think it's a concentration of poverty in, in, in various areas. It's a lot of it is also absent parents. Mm. Uh, you know, when you've not got a man in a house to, like we all had our fathers to show us, you know, the, the right way, the wrong way, uh, it's very hard for, for a single parent, isn't it? Yeah, it's a big problem, especially in the black community, the, uh, you know, absent fathers, which, um, you know, growing up, I I've got two boys myself and I, 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 any excuse to bring them up on GB News, I always do. But, you know, I I'm always trying to make sure I'm there for them. I'm setting an example for them. And I think you also need that, that male presence and the female presence. I think it's quite important if you can. I know things go wrong, but if you can to have that, you know, the mum and the dad around. Well, at the Wickish Charity, that's what we do. We literally mentor them, we put our arms around them and we give them that absent parent. And we also have actually ex-offenders, which are excellent. And they actually sit these children town and they talk about life in a cell. And, you know, fortunately, I haven't experienced it myself, but it's to be very uncomfortable from what they tell me and what I've heard. And it does make these, these youngsters stop and think. But we need to be doing a lot more of this. Ingrid, do you feel... Do you, you took the train here today, didn't you? No, I drove. You drove, OK. Do you, do you take public transport? Yes, I do. Do you feel safe on public transport? I do. Um, <laughs> that sounds terribly um, arrogant, but I, I don't know. Perhaps it's safety in numbers. It's a kind of strange thing. I, I'd feel safer on a tube in London. Of course, you get the, you hear these things where the, the, somebody goes absolutely kind of like nuts on the train. Um, but I live um, sort of in the countryside, and as the train empties, I feel a little bit more vulnerable mm. because there's less people around. And I know this is, it sounds really um, kind of arrogant, but I, and perhaps I'm hoping too much, but I just feel that if there's a lot of people around, somebody will come to help. Well, you say that, but the mm. amount of videos I've seen, I... Henry, of people, mainly from America, actually, but people getting attacked or being picked on or mugged, and people just sit in their tube carriage or on their bus, they put their heads down, they ignore it, and they just let people get on with it. Because do you know what? There was a case in one guy, Henry, you might have seen it in, in New York, um, a former Marine, he choke-held a guy who was threatening to kill tube passengers, metro passengers, he's now up on a murder charge. So when you feel like the state hasn't got your back and you're going to get done in for helping out, I can kind of understand why other people wouldn't get involved in that kind of situation. But I actually think people are on, on the tube and they are afraid. You know, it's that, it's that fl uh, flee or flight, isn't it? It's one of yeah. those things uh, that you're going to do. And sadly, most people are just going to flee. OK, thank you all so much. Riveting mm. debate. Coming up next, though, we're going to change gears to one of my absolute legends and heroes. Uh, the anticipated MJ the Musical has hit the West End and it's celebrating the legacy, of course, of Michael Jackson. It premiered last night, but critics, uh, including friend of the channel Benjamin Butterworth, they've asked if lauding the King of Pop accused and found innocent of child abuse is the right thing to do. So what do you guys think? I'll give you my thoughts after the break. This is Friday Night Live with me, Ben Leo, only on GB News. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast on the Met Always. As we go through the rest of this Easter weekend, for most of us, we've continued to see the mix of some sunshine, but also the risk of some rain at times. It's all courtesy of this area, low pressure, which is going to hang around as we go through the next few days. But with winds coming up from the south, it should feel a little bit less cold. So as we end Good Friday, still the risk of some showers across parts of Scotland, Northern Ireland, maybe western fringes of England and Wales, but elsewhere, turning clear with the risk of a few misty patches forming come dawn and also a touch of frost in the countryside. So we do start Saturday off on a bit of a chilly note but some sunshine from the word go. Risk of a little bit of cloud and patchy rain just reaching the very far east of England and the main focus of any showers tomorrow will be again across more western and northern parts of the country but there should be a little bit fewer and further between compared to today. 
Temperature wise, in the sunshine, not feeling too bad. Highs reaching around 14 or 15 degrees. Having a look at Easter day, a bit of a cloudy start across many eastern parts, but that will burn its way back towards the North Sea. So for many, again, it's another day of some sunny spells, risk of a few showers, potentially a little bit more in the way of persistent rain just arriving in the very far southwestern corner. And that sets us up for a bit of a north-south split on Monday. Rather grey and wet in the south, but hanging on to the sunshine further north. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's 8.36. You're with Ben Leo on Friday Night Live in for Mr Mark Dolan. So this week it was a big one in the West End uh, with the opening of MJ the Musical, which paid tribute to bangers like this. <laughs> what a tune. And it's definitely starting something, wink, wink, with many asking if we should <laughs> celebrate the legacy of Michael Jackson, who, as we all know, was accused of child sex abuse in uh, yesteryear. One such complainant was our dear friend Benjamin Butterworth, to which I pointed out that, crucially, Michael was found innocent of all charges. And there's his tweet there saying that the musical was a hideous insult to the victims of Michael Jackson and even comparing him to Jimmy Savile or Gary Glitter. We know he likes to talk nonsense, our Benjamin. <laughs> the Evening Standard uh, reviewed the show, which opened on Broadway in 2022, as a, quote, ravishing spectacle, if you ignore the elephant in the room. So I'm asking you, should the musical stay or beat it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's discuss this now with my Friday friends, TV personality Ingrid Tarrant and political commentator Kai Wilshaw. Kai, are you an MJ fan? Look, I love his music, but... At some point, you have to reckon with the fact that some of our heroes are imperfect, right? I mean, Benjamin makes a great point, and I totally Does agree with him. Does he Comparing him to Savile? You haven't well, asked. Savile was never charged. And, uh, yeah, but he's, similarly he, he was to a Michael verified Jackson. and provable monster. Uh, yeah, Ma Ma Michael Jackson went to court. He was found innocent of all charges in a very thorough and extensive investigation. The FBI have probed him. You know, he, he's, 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 he's got a, a no uh, case... I mean, he's dead now. Of course he's got no case to answer, but he had no case to answer. Look, inevitably, his cultural impact is going to continue. We're not hearing the last of Michael Jackson, right? But let's well, be pe real. People of your real are trying to get him cancelled but, but, from the West End. But, but So, let me just give you a few facts. His older sister uh, called him a paedophile. A documentary showed him holding hands with a 12-year-old and talking about sleepovers with Right, members. OK. S uh, stay on that point. Was that the Martin Bashir documentary? Yes. Martin Bashir, by the way, a very upstanding journalist who mm -hmm. definitely wasn't involved in any controversy Do, with Princess Diana. Let me show you a quick clip of Martin Bashir and Michael Jackson. And this clip, OK, explains... You'll see it in a second, but let me just give some context. He's talking about how he was in a, a recording studio as a kid. He looked out through the window and cried tears of sadness because he saw other kids playing in the park, which he couldn't do. Let's take a quick look at it. I remember precisely 
going to Motown Studios to record. And right across the street from the studio was a park. And I could hear the roar of the, you know, the Little League team, and they were playing soccer and football and volleyball, and they were playing baseball. And I remember a lot of the times looking back and really hiding my face, crying. God bless the man. Ingrid, does that explain the fact that, yes, of course, Michael Jackson was a very disturbed gentleman, but in my opinion, he wasn't a paedophile? I'm exactly on the yes. same page as you, More I have for you. to say. Sorry, Kai. <laughs> um, he, had, he had a deprived childhood. His father was very, very strict. He was, um, he was a bully. He was... He, worked them to the absolute bone. I think with um, their first hit, I think Michael Jackson was 10 years old, might have mm. been eight, but he was uh, thereabouts. So he didn't have a normal childhood at all. And actually, I think because of that, because he was propelled into this very adult world, business world, um, it was a kind of reclaiming, or he never really grew up. He was... Um, I mean, emotionally they're... immature, let's call it that way. And holding hands with um, these boys and everything, I don't see... That doesn't mean you're a paedophile. Lots of people do that. And my, my point has always been, Kai, what kind mm. of monster would go on television and sit there and say with such glee and innocence that he likes sharing beds with children because, you know, he likes sleepovers and milk and cookies? I mean, he sounds like a, a kid himself, but what kind of monster who had sinister intentions would go on TV and do that? Well, how are we to know? How are we to know what was going on in his mind, right? And I'm not denying that people will enjoy this musical. I don't think we should ban it, but I don't have to like it. I think it's Well, ben, Benjamin enough. Butterworth wants it banned. Well, you don't agree with that. Uh, look, look, uh, we're not of one mind, me and Benjamin. We're, we're different people. Well, viewers uh, reckon you're, you're more woke than Benjamin, which is something. Oh, that's, that's quite an accolade. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the, the other problem with this, of course, is that all of these allegations, whether or not you believe them, whether or not they were proven true or not, the fact is you'd be none the wiser if you saw this musical because, as that review shows, it's an elephant in the room. It's not discussed. It's not reckoned with. I mean, but how it is, is that all fair? About the it's this fair whitewashing it's all about of his music. reputation. It's the musical, therefore the music. It's not a biop type but thing. We, it's... But we can't separate the the but art from the art. you should because you shouldn't. I don't think it's fair to taint an already tainted name. Just concentrate on the music because that's what people are. are um, up about. And actually, sort of, um, Benjamin, who I have a huge amount of respect for, actually, <laughs> I don't agree with him at all, um, but he can't liken it with um, Jimmy Savile. You said he wasn't proven guilty, but the thing was, everybody knew he was guilty. They just kept mm. quiet about it, which was absolutely horrendous. And, of course, Gary Glitter was, and he's done time for it as well. And you, so you can't. The fact is, he wasn't proven guilty, and I think that's enough. And, therefore, don't bring that into it at all, because that's not what this is all about. I think, and I, think... I can't wait to go and see it. Well, I'll be well, dancing in the I aisles. won't be joining you if that's all right. I just think it's very convenient, isn't it, that people who are big fans of MJ are twisting themselves in knots trying to justify... I didn't just twist myself in knots. It. I didn't twist I mean... myself in knots. In actual fact, um, I was really curious, and I'm a very open-minded person. I'm not going to be um, persuaded or biased just because I, I'm a great fan of his. But when I looked at that documentary, honestly, I felt that the boys were discrediting themselves more and more and more, and particularly the mothers, because look what they got from it. And why did they keep sending them back there? And apparently, anyway, it's not sharing a room, because his room is on three floors. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Mm. Look, I, 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 just, I really just don't think someone who had such sinister intentions would go and sit with Martin Bashir and talk about having milk and cookies and sleepovers with, with young lads. He was obviously a very disturbed individual. Like, he, he, he was a weirdo, let's be frank. I love him. I think his music is great. Mm. And actually, this sounds a bit woo-woo, but I don't think you can make music that pure if you've got such a dark heart. But others would say, I spoke to someone earlier, they said, well, maybe people, you know, paedophiles or abusers, Maybe they don't think they're doing anything wrong and they're acting, you know, that that, that is their normal, you know? But who knows? Anyway, well, fascinating it, discussion. Yeah. I'm certainly going to go to the West End to see it <laughs> and I'm going to keep playing those MJ bangers on 
my <laughs> phone as well. Although I haven't heard many Michael Jackson tunes on the radio recently, so maybe he has. Oh, well, that's another thing. He was banned off on, from every radio station until, or during the case, until he was proven innocent, and then they played the music again. Everybody banned his music. Well, he, do, you know, do you know what he did in recent years? I need to move on, but in recent years before he died, he was exposing Hollywood, exposing the elites and how things work, uh, and then, unfortunately, he, uh, he left us. But... MJ, I love you. Some people don't. Ben Buckworth doesn't. But uh, <laughs> yeah, we move on. Right, coming up next, as 300 kids go feral in Milton Keynes, storming a shopping centre and causing havoc, should parents be punished for the poor behaviour of their children? I'm talking fines, maybe even prison. We're joined by show favourite Alexandra Marshall in just a moment. Stay with us. Monday to Thursday from 7pm. Now, the massive debate back across the pond is NATO. Yeah. Everyone's talking NATO every day. Uh, it was your comments about them not paying enough, not they paying 2%. Pay. And they you said pay. this, you said it again recently. You made a comment, well, the Russians can do whatever they want if these guys don't pay. Well, that's now being that's, used. Well, they can use it. I don't really care if they use it okay. because what I'm saying is that's a form of negotiation. Uh, why should we guard these, these countries that have a lot of money and the United States was paying for most of NATO? And when I went there, and I already had it out with them, and now they stopped paying again. But now they're paying because of those comments that you saw two, three weeks ago. The question was asked by the head of a major country in front of everyone else, 28 countries at the time, including us. They said, so if we don't pay our bills, are you going to protect us from Russia? I said, you mean you're delinquent? You're not paying the bills? Yes. Nope, I'm not going to pay you. We're not going to do it. We're not going to defend you. If you're not paying your bills, we're not going to defend you. It's very simple. And hundreds of billions of dollars came flowing in. Now, if I say, yes, I am, they're not going to pay their bills. Why would they do that? NATO has to treat the U.S. fairly, because if it's not for the United States, NATO literally doesn't even exist. But they took advantage of us, like most countries do. If they start to pay their bills properly, and the club is fair, are places like Poland defended? Will America be there? I believe the United States was paying 90% of NATO, the cost of yep. NATO, it could be 100%. Yep. It was the most unfair thing. And don't forget, it's more important to them than it is to us. We have an ocean in between some problems. It's more important for them. They were taking advantage, and they did. They took advantage of us okay. on trade, and they took advantage on So if the they military. play fair, if they start to play fair, America's there. Yes, 100%, 100%. Thank you. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm at risk of doing an Ed Miliband here by uh, cracking on with these Easter eggs during the breaks. Um, just about got away with that one. Now, we've all heard of the saying, letting your kids run riot. But this was taken to extremes yesterday when, and you've probably seen this, a 300-strong army of children charged through Milton Keynes Shopping Centre, shouting and screaming for no apparent reason. Thames Valley Police issued a dispersal order following what they described as anti-social chaos. But the real reason, or well, the real question, rather, is where were the parents? Surely they have to take some responsibility for their children's behaviour. What do you think? Should parents be punished for their kids' behaviour? Should they be fined? Should they be sent to prison? Should they have their social security docs, perhaps? I'm joined now by online editor of The Spectator of Australia, Alexandra Marshall. Good evening, good morning. What time is it there, Alexandra? Way too early <laughs> on a Saturday morning, but it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you, really appreciate it. So, look, what is the solution to this 
uh, what people are calling antisocial chaos. Should we start fining parents for the way their kids behave? Well, it's an interesting question because although that looks really bad what happened in the UK, we have problems like this in Australia, but dialed up to a thousand, where young kids and juveniles in remote areas are running around towns with tomahawks and axes and spears and you know, breaking into people's homes. It's a real disaster here. So we've been asking this question for a while in Australia. We've come down to a couple of points. One, if you're here as an asylum seeker and your kids are running wild and causing chaos, then yes, we think that should be a violation and the family should be punished for that. If you're failing to send your children to school on a regular basis, which is happening in remote communities, there's a general feeling that that is a failure of parents and parents should be punished for that kind of uh, not raising your children to the standard that everybody else is being told to. But in this case, I think the children need to be punished themselves. Otherwise, they will not learn a lesson here. So my take is significant community service. So maybe 100 hours each they must complete. Otherwise, there will be further punishments because I guarantee you the kids will not enjoy community service and that is the most likely thing to stop them from behaving like that again. Yeah, stick them in the army, national service. But, Alexandra, the problem <laughs> is, over here, the kids aren't... Kids aren't afraid of prison. They're not afraid of their parents. They're not afraid of teachers. They look at the police and, you know, I agree with them, actually. They look at the police and most of the time they're just a laughing stock. I remember when I was a kid, you saw a police officer and, you know, you knew things were getting serious. But there's just no respect in any walk of life now for these youngsters. I would argue that's because there's no punishment for their bad behaviour. So perhaps if they actually had to show up for some of these punishments and did actually have the real threat of either a criminal record if they don't show up or some kind of additional punishment like being forced to join the army for a year after they leave school or something like that, then they would start to respect the police. At the moment, you have a similar problem to us where crime is not police. They're given a slap on the wrist and let go. And so you can't fix that by punishing parents because they won't punish their kids either. If anything, they might make it worse. And I'm very cautious about punishing other people for the crimes that they're not related to. Yeah, I would I, rather see people who actually commit the crime do some kind of service and punishment so that they learn the lesson. Otherwise, they won't. They'll just resent their parents, run away and keep being criminals. Yeah, I, I just don't think prison and the like over this side of the pond is, uh, is much of a deterrent. It's Community more like service. butlins or pontins, you know. Service. Let, let, let me bring in my... Um, paid off something. Let, let, let me bring in my Friday friends, uh, Ingrid Tarrant and Kai Wilshaw. Ingrid, what should we do? Should we find parents for... for uh, Naughty kids. It won't work. Probably no. they haven't mm. got any money um, in the first place. So how do you do that? Some might be able to afford the fine, others won't. So therefore, you've got their to... benefits. Uh, do you know? Why? I, 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 I don't know if that's a, a solution. Then uh, you've got to claim it. How are you going to do that? Yes, you could dock it from the benefits, but then it'll be human rights, and then they might have other children, and they suffer from from having less money, so they can't feed them. Um, it's a huge, huge problem. The problem as well, is, of course, is that if they're under 16, there's very little they can do. Um, if a, a punishment, we aren't punishing them hard enough, you're absolutely right, it's sort of like Easy Street, but they don't get to prison in any case because if it's a, a sentence that's six months or under um, 12 months, I believe, mm. perhaps even two years, um, it's a suspended sentence. All the prisons are full... So even bigger crimes, I don't know how okay, let, bad let, this let me, was. Let me bring in Kai. Are bad kids uh, always the result of bad parents? Not always. It's, as always, a combination of different things. But I think parents are definitely partly responsible. But I totally agree that we can't be punishing parents for the sins of the child, right? They're, they're, that's so reductive. And I don't think we sh that prison is the answer either, you know, f let alone the cost, 46 thousand pounds we're, 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 we're just, we're just getting up like San Francisco, a crime ridden hell. Alexandra, last word to you. Very I was going to say, I never said prison. I said, I said community service. Make them do things they don't want to do, like clean up parks, pick up rubbish, mow lawns, that kind of thing that's beneficial to the community. Or if it's such a large-reaching problem, set up the camps to get them some military trainings and discipline and take them yeah. out of the environment that's causing them to be so badly behaved. Agreed. I spent some time in San Francisco last year. It is an absolute crime-ridden hellhole. There's no consequences for anyone's actions. People are, uh, you know, go, go see for yourself. It's a sight to behold. Right, that's all for me tonight. Coming up, it's Patrick Christie's. He's got a cracking show in store. Patrick, what's on the agenda? Yeah, no, Grace, but thank you very, very much. Well, I'm
got an interview with former Immigration Minister Robert Jemrick. It's no holds barred. He talks very openly about sexual assault taking place amongst asylum seekers, an issue that we've been really trying to raise here on GB News. He also appears to suggest anyway that Rishi Sunak never cared about mass immigration. Nigel Farage has got an exclusive message to Rishi Sunak as well. There was talk of some deal being done between the Tories and Nigel. Well, Nigel's got that message. And Queers for Palestine want us to boycott... Eurovision. Oh, and there is an update on the King's health. All to play for tonight. Excellent. Can't wait. I'm really excited for that interview with Robert Jenrick. Right, that's all from me. Mark Dolan is back on Monday. Thank you so much for you, the viewers watching on this bank holiday weekend. Ingrid Tarrant, Kai Wilshaw, despite being the wokest man in Britain. <laughs> As I said, Mark is back next week. I'm back tomorrow morning by myself on Saturday Morning Live and Saturday 5 tomorrow night. For now, I'm going to crack on with these. Happy Easter to you. Warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast on the Met Always. As we go through the rest of this Easter weekend, for most of us, we've seen, continued to see the mix of some sunshine, but also the risk of some rain at times. It's all courtesy of this area, low pressure, which is going to hang around as we go through the next few days. But with winds coming up from the south, it should feel a little bit less cold. So as we end Good Friday, still the risk of some showers across parts of Scotland, Northern Ireland, maybe western fringes of England and Wales, but elsewhere, turn and clear with the risk of a few misty patches forming come dawn and also a touch of frost in the countryside. So we do start Saturday off on a bit of a chilly note but some sunshine from the word go. Risk of a little bit of cloud and patchy rain just reaching the very far east of England and the main focus of any showers tomorrow will be again across more western and northern parts of the country but there should be a little bit fewer and further between compared to today. Temperature-wise, in the sunshine, not feeling too bad. Highs reaching around 14 or 15 degrees. Having a look at Easter Day, a bit of a cloudy start across many eastern parts, but that will burn its way back towards the North Sea. So for many, again, it's another day of some sunny spells, risk of a few showers, potentially a little bit more in the way of persistent rain just arriving in the very far southwestern corner. And that sets us up for a bit of a north-south split on Monday. Rather grey and wet in the south, but hanging on to the sunshine further north. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their